You were glad to be here as I am. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. I think every, is, uh, is, I don't know. Is everything turned on? You have to ask somebody else besides me, brother. Ask some guy that knows. I guess, it, is it turned on? I can see. How can turn? you tell? It is now. It is now. There you go. It wasn't turned on. Now we're ready to roll. Uh, well, you know, I uh, just had to tell something on myself, you know. Uh, Brother Duke, Dave Duke, uh, that's a missionary you're supporting. If it is, say amen. amen. All right, uh, I got a real blessing. I got the opportunity to ordain him amen. when he was ordained. That's a blessing, brother. Amen. And there was a great big church out there. And before I got up to ordain him, I didn't know Brother Dave Duke. And I thought, I'm not going to know this guy's name. And I need to remember it some way or another. And so one of the ladies in the church there, the memory, uh, she says to me, she said, Do you know that guy down south, Duke, down there? Some, do anybody know some guy down south by the name of Duke? How many of you know some guy down south by the name of Duke? I don't know no guy down south by the name of Duke. I said, who's that? I don't know that. I won't tell me nothing. But she said, okay, you have to do it like this. You put up your Dukes. Well, that's one Duke. So that's Dave Duke, just one, not both of them, just one Duke. Dave Duke. And I said, I got that, I got that, I got Dave Duke. So I get up and I'm preaching the message and his ordination, and I'm just a rolling down through it, and I'm a screaming and going. And I says, Brother Seth! <laughs> and I mean, I didn't leave it alone, man. <laughs> I just kept on going. I come around again. Well, brother Fisk! <laughs> I mean, I must have said it a hundred times. I mean, boy, and my wife, she's just ready to come unglued. <laughs> There's a couple other preachers there, and I'm in there just going, and, and, no, and he just kept looking at me, you know, like this. I got you, know, and I thought, that must be his name. I got it right. And I look at my fist, you know. <laughs> I'm saying, brother Fisk, yeah, that's it. <laughs> I never did get it. I got through with a message, and they said, you know what you did? I said, I did what? Oh, man. <laughs> so the Lord takes care of us, don't he? Yeah. <laughs> In spite of us. <laughs> and so he's brought me back here to preach at you again. And so I've been praying about it and studying about it and thinking about it. And now I want to preach to you something tonight that's been a blessing to my own heart. And so if you'll take your Bible... And turn to the book of Deuteronomy. And turn to Deuteronomy chapter uh, 3. And I'm going to preach on two words. Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse 25. And preach on two words in the verse. If you're there, say amen. 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 Okay, that means i got to wait on somebody else. You ready? If you're there, say amen. Amen. Okay, you ready? I pray thee, let me go over and see this good land that is beyond Jordan, that goodly mountain, and Lebanon. Underline it. The goodly what? Okay, that's what I want to preach on. The goodly mountain. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray tonight you please wash me in your precious blood. I pray that you would cleanse my mind. I pray that you would cleanse my heart. I pray that you would wash me and make me clean in your sight. I pray that you would fill me with the Holy Spirit from the top of my head to the bottom of my toes. And Father, I pray you would help me say anything I shouldn't say. And Father, I pray you would help me to say everything I should say. And I pray this evening that you would help your people to understand these mountains and climb the bottom. And by your grace, apply it to their hearts and minds and souls and to their lives. And Lord, I just trust that you will do the work. And Lord, I pray in this prayer in Jesus' precious name and for his faith. Amen. Amen. Now, I want you to uh, look at the verse. It says, goodly mountains. And so I got on a conviction about climbing a mountain. I thought to myself, we got, you guys don't have any mountains out here to climb. All you got rolling hills like that, rolling hills like that. You ain't got a mountain. I didn't see a mountain anywhere. Is there any mountains here? I don't know. I didn't see one. 
But out there where I'm from, brother, we got some mountains like that. And them mountains go up and you climb one of those babies and you know you climb something. And you start climbing, your feet hurt, hurt, and you climb that thing and you get at the top of that thing, you know you've been somewhere. And that's what just a rolling off of you. And I've climbed many of them. And then I get to the Bible and I said, Lord, I want to climb some mountains in this book. I want to climb some mountains in here. And so I go through there and I want to climb some mountains. So I, want, I find some. And then I said, now what do those mountains mean, Lord? What do they mean? What do they stand for? What do they apply to? So there's a mountains I want you to get tonight. I want you to turn to them. The first one is found over there in 2 Samuel chapter 24. So take your Bible and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 24 and look at the first mountain. And I'll show you what it means and I want you to climb it. By the grace of God, you ought to climb this mountain. And I trust that you will. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 24 and uh, let's look at verse 24. 2 Samuel chapter 24 and verse 24 and it says and the king said unto uh, Adrani nay but I will surely buy it of thee at a price at a price now this mountain that's mentioned here in the passage is Mount Moriah that's the mountain here that's mentioned. It's mentioned in Second Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1, Mount Moriah. It's mentioned in First uh, Chronicles chapter 21, verse 24, Mount Moriah. Now, Mount Moriah is in Jerusalem. It's right there in Jerusalem. Mount Moriah is that place where you come, and how many of you ever heard of Mount Moriah? Say amen. amen. And that's that place over in Jerusalem. You all know where it is. But the point is, what does it stand for? What does Mount Moriah stand for? Let's read the rest of 24. And the king said unto Adonai, Nay, but I will surely buy of thee at a price, neither will I offer burnt offering. Now David is getting ready to offer a burnt offering on Mount Moriah because David is sinned back there in verse 1. And, against the ang uh, and again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. So David is sinned, and then he's making an offering for his sin. He's a high priest. How many understand the passage? Say amen. amen. Now, here's what the mountain stands for. Now watch it. Neither will I offer burnt offering unto the Lord my God, of that which doest cost me what? Nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen of 40 shekels of silver. Now underline, he says, Neither will I offer unto the Lord anything that does what? That cost me what? Nothing. Nothing. So David says, I won't do it because it didn't cost me anything. He says, if I'm going to serve God and do what I'm supposed to do, it's got to cost me something to serve God. You know what that mountain is? That's a mountain of climbing and paying the cost that it's going to cost you to serve God. Every person here is going to cost him something to serve God. It's going to cost you something. Now, sometimes the cost is big, sometimes the cost is small, but it's going to cost you something. Now, let me ask you. Let me ask you, how many of you here tonight come to this church regularly? Say amen. amen. How many of you drive uh, 10 miles to come to this church? At least 10 miles. One, two, three. How many of you drive uh, 15 miles to come to this church? At least 15. Anybody 20? Whoa, whoa. Anybody 25? Ooh, wow. Man, that's a long way. You say 25 miles? Yeah, you get in your car, you pay for the gas, you pay for time. If you drive 25 miles one way, that means you drive 25 miles back. That means you went 50 miles a day to come to church. Some folks just come right across the street. So you pay the cost. It's not a big cost, is it? It's not a big cost, but it's a cost. 
Your Christianity ought to cost you something. What does it cost you? you got to pay the cost. you got to be willing to climb Mount Moriah and say, God, I'm going to pay the cost. I'm going to pay the cost to serve you in order that every Christian ought to pay a cross every day, every day to serve the Lord. Ought to cost you something. Do you know what it's like? God's people don't, they want to serve God, but they don't want to pay a cost. They're, I'll come to church if it's convenient. I'll serve God if it doesn't cost me anything. I don't want to pay a cost in anything. So they come to church and they never tithe. They go back home. didn't cost them anything. They ought to pay a cost to serve God. Amen? You know what it's like? It's like this. I had a fellow in my church one day. And I, I said to him, I said, Virgil, uh, the guy that was supposed to drive the bus didn't come. Would you mind driving the bus and going picking all the kids up and coming back? He says, uh, well, well, there's nobody else to drive it? I said, no, Virgil, somebody needs to drive the bus. Would you drive it? He says, oh, okay, I'll drive it. And he got in the bus and drove the van. It was a van. And he drove the van out, drove around, picked all the kids up, and he come back. And he got back, and he said to me, he says, Preacher, I'm never going to do that again. I says, what? He said, because my feet got cold. And I said to myself, you didn't pay much of a cost. You didn't pay so much of a cost. One time you drive that bus, your feet get cold. One time? You mean to tell me you can't serve God? It's not going to cost you something? You ought to, it ought to cost you something to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. You folks are coming to church. I know you pay a cost. You come to this church. This church is the what kind of, what's the name of this church? Bible Believers Baptist Church. Bible Believers Baptist Church? I bet you they say, out there at that church, they believe the King James Bible. I bet you those folk out there believe the King James Bible. Are you one of those nuts that believe the King James Bible? I think that's a cult out there that belongs to King James Bible. I think you guys are a cult. They're going to call you Martinites. You say, what for? For believing that right there. I bet you this Christian world around here, a whole bunch don't believe that. You raise that book up in the air and say, that King James Bible right there is the living word of the living God. There's no mistakes in it. You know what some of you are going to have to do? Somebody you work with, somebody you live with, you open up your mouth and you tell them that. You know what some of are going to do? They're going to start looking their nose down at you and say, you're weird. You're weird. You're peculiar. There's something weird about you. I'll tell you something. A Christian who can't pay a cost, say, I believe the King James Bible is the word of God. He can't pay that cost. You know what's going to happen to him? He'll just close that book up and say, well, I don't know if I want to pay that cost or not. I don't want folks to think I'm weird. you got to pay a cost to serve God. Yeah. If you're going to climb Mount Moriah, you're going to have to pay a cost every day in your Christian life. You'll never cross, climb the mountain Moriah if you don't pay a cost. It ought to cost you something with your friend. It ought to cost you something to serve the Lord Jesus Christ every single day in your life. I, went, I have a Bible class on Friday night. And on Friday night, I, I did, didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to go up to the Bible class. I got to get in my truck and drive up there. And there was a storm coming in. It comes in quite regular there in Montana. <laughs> and there was a storm coming in there. And I was driving up the road. And the storm was blowing in the windshield. And I thought to myself, uh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Do I want to go to this Bible class and teach four people in the Bible class? I wished I had a Bible class with about 100 people to preach to it. Man, I could really go to that. But four people? Come on! I get up there, get up there, and the four people are that. I go in and sit down and open up my Bible to them. And there's a stranger there. And then the woman in the house says, uh, Preacher, he's lost. He's lost. And I say, Oh boy, I'm so glad I came. So I open up my Bible. 
I preached to that guy the gospel in the book of Revelation. <laughs> you say the gospel in the book of Revelation. You can find the gospel anywhere in that book, brother. Yeah. It's all through there. Jesus died for your sins. It's from beginning to end. Yeah. You know what's wrong with a lot of Christians? They don't want to pay the cost of... Uh, of climbing Mount Moriah. Take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 19. Now take your Bible and turn to Matthew 19. If you're going to climb the mountain, and I, I want you to climb the mountain, you know there's something in it every time you see a mountain you want to climb it? Just out there I see one, and there's just something inside of it, just down inside, it says, I want to climb that. I want to climb that. I want to see what's on the other side. I want to get off the top. Just, you know, just, don't you ever, you've never seen any mountains, that's the problem. You ought to see some mountains, you ought to come out to Montana and see some mountains. We've got some mountains out there. Brother, you look at those mountains, look at them a while, and look at them a while, and then pretty soon something down inside you say, I want to climb that mountain. It's fun to climb. Climb Mount Ryan, cost you something. Cost you something, but I'll tell you something, you'll get a good feeling. When you do something for God, it will give you a good feeling. When you, come on, don't you feel bad when you do rotten? Yeah. Well, that's what you're supposed to feel bad. <laughs> you're supposed to feel bad when you do rotten. Well, you'll feel bad, you'll feel good when you do good. You want a good feeling? Then do good. Do something. Climb a mountain and get a good feeling, brother. Uh, it ought to cost you to serve God. It ought to cost you. Now, turn to Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 19. Was I, That's where I was. Turn to Matthew chapter 19 and look at verse 27. Now look at it. Matthew chapter 19 verse 27. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all. Underline it. Forsaken all. How much have you forsaken? We have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, That in which ye have followed me in the regeneration... When the Son of Man shall sit upon the throne of his glory. When's that? That's the millennium. That's when Jesus Christ comes back and sets up his kingdom and reigns in the millennium. So when Jesus Christ returns, what's he going to do? He's going to pay you back. Now watch it. Ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. For every one that hath forsaken, what? How many of you forsook a house? For the Lord. Now, did he say forsaken house? Forsake a house? You say, how's that? When God tells you to do something, you say, well, Lord, I'd just soon stay here and enjoy my house. I like this house. I'd sure like to have that house. I really don't want to give up that house. But if, Lord, if you want me to do something else, I'll give that house up. I've met many a missionary give up a house. Amen. I've met many a man that come to me and say, I had a nice, big, beautiful house with um, well, cars and boats and everything, and God called me to the mission field, and I give it up. Then if you give it up, what's going to happen? Does it say down in the next verse, in verse 29, does it say a hundredfold? Come on. Does it say a hundredfold? What does that mean now? That means... One house here is worth how many over that? A hundred. I can't count real good, but now I mean, I'm in town for one and a hundred. I would say that sure out beats that by a big shot. <laughs> Wouldn't you? And you can't cost nothing to serve the Lord. You, you say, well, I don't give the, I just don't want to give this up here, man, a hundred, a hundred fold. Wouldn't you give it up a hundred fold? You can't beat that at the bank. If you put your money in the bank, you'd come up on the short end of the stick. Why don't you do it for the Lord? A hundred fold, man, that's it. You can't, that ain't even gambling. You say that's gambling, not when the Lord said it, it ain't. If the Lord said it, how many believe God meant what he said? Amen. Then you ought, to, you ought to pay the cost. You ought to pay the cost. You ought to claim Mount Riah. And he says what? Knows what else he said. He said a hundredfold. And a house. And, and brethren. That means you and your brothers. And a sister. That means a sister. 
and a father. Well, we're getting right down home now. And a mother. I mean, suppose you say a mother and a father, you're getting right down home now. And a wife. That'd be pretty rough. You ought to serve for the wife. You say, oh, preacher, can that happen? Oh, it might happen. Hmm. Might happen. And, uh, and uh, children and land. For my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold. I got to looking at that one day and I was looking down through that. And I said, a hundred houses and a uh, hundred children, a hundred mothers, a hundred fathers, and a hundred wives. <laughs> and I said, Lord, there's something wrong. And I know that ain't right. Because you told me over there that he should be the husband of one wife. And Lord, that just don't kind of think there's something wrong. You know what the Lord says? Keep reading, stupid. <laughs> now, did you get it? You say, how do you figure that? If that's a problem, you get in the same problem. You stop reading before you got the answer to it. <laughs> Amen. You stop reading before you got the answer. Uh, now, take your Bible and turn to Mark chapter 10 and look at verse 28. The Lord is going to uh, reward you, what? A hundredfold. So therefore you ought to do like David said, I will not serve God that didn't cost me anything. It ought to cost you something. The bigger the cost, the greater the cost. Amen. Pay the cost because the Lord, it's worth it. The Lord will pay you back. All right, look at Mark chapter 10. Take your Bible and turn to Mark chapter 10. And uh, look at verse uh, 28. Mark chapter 10. And look at verse 28. Now it says, but he shall receive, now watch it, a hundredfold. Isn't that what he said over there in Matthew, a hundredfold? Now in this life, now watch it, houses. Did he say houses over there in Matthew? Say amen. amen. And brethren, didn't he say that in Matthew? Amen. And sisters, said he, he said that in Matthew. And mothers, he said that in Matthew. And children, he said that in Matthew. And lands, he said that in Matthew. Did he say wives in this passage? See? He explains it. He explains it. He leaves out. So you know who and you and I married to anyway. When the day comes, we're going to be married to the Lord. I'm already engaged to him. I'm going to be married to the Lord. I already got me a wife or a husband. That's a great mystery. <laughs> It's a great mystery. All I know is I'm going to have a good time there. I'm going to be married. <laughs> you don't think that's confusing? That's confusing. There's some of the Bible. You can, no man can understand all the Bible, can he, brother? I don't understand all that book. Anybody understand all that book? Say amen. It's me. You said the wrong time. <laughs> oh, me. Is it not an amen? Is it oh, me? Nobody understands all that book. <laughs> Nobody does. Not a man in the space of this earth who understands all that book. But I know something. I believe it. I believe it. I may not be able to read the words in it. I may not be able to spell the words in it. And I may not be able to understand the words in it. But I believe the words in it. Amen. Then climb Mount Moriah and make sure that you uh, do like it says. But it was thee at thy price, neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doeth cost me, what? Nothing. Pay the cost and climb Mount Moriah. Now take your Bible and turn to another mountain. Turn to Genesis chapter 8. Here's another mountain. Turn to Genesis and turn to Genesis chapter 8 and look at verse 4. Now turn to the verse. Genesis chapter 8 and look at verse 4. Now watch what this mountain is. You've got to climb this mountain. And the ark rested in the seventh month on the seventeenth day of the month upon the mount of what? Everybody say it. Mount what? Ararat. Mount Ararat. Now here's a mountain you've got to climb this mountain. What's Mount Ararat? This is the ark. And the ark is gone and trading and landed on Mount Ararat. And you got uh, Noah and his sons in the ark. So what does Mount Ararat represent? It represents, if anything, a new start. A new start. A new beginning. A brand new start. 
climb the mountain and get you a brand new start. How many of you would like, sometime in your Christian life, you just get dull, like this brother was saying here, uh, Nathan. Sometimes just things get dull and dead and kind of... you got a good name, Nathan. you got to stand up, man. you got to stand up. you got a good name to live up for. Nathan the prophet. you got a good name. Amen? Better live up to it. <laughs> uh, anyway, what does that have to do with it? Nothing. Uh, but a new start. <laughs> A new start, man, and get you a new start. How do you get a new start? What? How did how did Noah get a new start? He got rid of the old world. He got rid of the old world. You now you want a new start? You don't want a new start? You got to get rid of the old world. Take your Bible and turn to the book of Romans and turn to Romans chapter twelve. If you want a new start, you got to get rid of the world. And what did Noah do? Noah gave up the world, and God gave it back him, to him again. <laughs> If you give, give up the world here, God will give it back to you again over there in the millennium. So give it up. God will give it back to you. He just won't give it back to you here. God don't like the world anyway. The world's under the power of the devil right now. The devil's running this world. You ought to give it up. You ought to give it up. Look at Romans chapter 12. Look at verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now watch it. And be not conformed to this world. You know what people do? They want to be conformed to this world. Now, I can preach on it because there's nobody here tonight, but you ever see a man with long hair? You ever see a man with long hair and his hair grows way down long and gets right long and long down like that? I like all these young men with not, without that long hair. Uh, Never grow your hair long. And I'll tell you why. You know why? Because in the Bible, every man that grows his hair long was rebelling against them. It shows rebellion against authority. It's rebelling against your father when you grow your hair long. Never get you an earring right here. You know what that's for? The women wear earrings. Boys don't wear earrings. Men don't wear earrings. And I got this guy in my church. He's got an earring and he's got long hair. And you say, Preacher, what you going to do? I'll give you three guesses. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come along and I'm going to say, look at this verse. Look at this verse. You say, what will a guy do? You know, you know what, we're in a day and a generation where people rebel against authority of every kind. They re re rebel against God's authority. You'll never get a new start till you give up this whole world and say, I'm going to put it behind me, I'm going to give it up, and I want me a new start. So Noah got him a brand new start. You say, how do you get your new start? I'll tell you how you get a new start. You've got to change some things. You got to change some things. Ever now and then, I uh, g I just say, Lord, I got to have me a brand new start. And I don't do like some guys did. I heard of a guy one time. He said, I just took all my notes from my Bible and I took all my notes away and stuck all my notes aside and I threw them all away and I started brand new and started reading the Bible brand new. I thought that was the dumbest thing in the world to get a new start. You know, I think a new start is just going back there and saying, oh, Lord, I'm going to keep right on reading your book and I'm going to remember every good thing that you showed me in the book. Lord, I'm just going to get something new from your book that I've never saw before, ever before. And you show it to me and keep right on going. Show you how to get a new start. Take your Bible and turn to Genesis. Turn to Genesis and turn to Genesis chapter 30. Uh, Five, Genesis chapter 35 and look at verse 1. Genesis chapter 35 and look at verse 1. Climb in the mountain and climb Mount Ararat. It, uh, it's like getting a new start. Genesis chapter 35 and look at verse 1. And it says, it says in verse 1, And God said unto Jacob, Arise, and go up to Bethel. Now, underline the word Bethel. I'm not going to talk about that mountain, but that's a good mountain. But he said, rise and go to Bethel. Now, what's at Bethel? You remember what's at Bethel. That was the ladder that Jacob climbed up the ladder. No, he didn't climb the ladder. The angels climbed the ladder. And Jacob saw the angels go back and forth to heaven. And that's the place that Jacob called the house of God was Bethel. That's where Jacob met God. And God says to him, go back to Bethel. 
So that's a place of blessing. That's a placing of what? Uh, Jacob has been out of fellowship for 20 years with the Lord. He's been out of fellowship with him for 20 years. And so he's going to get back in fellowship with the Lord. And so he says, do what? Go back to Bethel. Now watch it. Now watch it. Uh, and, and dwell there and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleest from the face of Esau thy brother. Now watch verse 2. Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him. Now underline. Put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. You know how to get a new start? Put away some old things that the Holy Spirit convicts you about. Put them away and get some clean thoughts going through your mind. Get rid of some of the things that you have. Ask God to give you a new start. You get a new start by putting away some old things. Getting that old world out Amen. and get away Amen. and throw them away. And I preach against smoking in my church. I get up there and I, I preach why it's, a, why it's wrong to smoke. I get up there in my church and I preach why it's wrong to go get drunk. And I preach right there. And you want to get a new start? I'll tell you how to get a new start. Get rid of that thing right there that you say is okay to take a little nip now and then. Take a little nip now and then. And I trust I ain't preaching it to anybody. I trust that I'm preaching it to somebody down the road somewhere. <laughs> and nobody in here would ever do something like that. But you never can tell. Maybe some Christian, he takes a little nip now and then, puts it aside. Thinks it's okay. I'll tell you something. You want a new start? Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get it out of there. Get, get a plum out of there. And then say, oh God, I want a new start. God, I'll give you a new start. I'll tell you how to get a new start. I had a one time guy stand up in my church and he said, Preacher, I'm going to try to quit cigar smoking cigarettes and I want everybody to pray for me. And I've had that three or four times. But you know what I've never had? I've never had a woman stand up and say, I'm going to quit running off my mouth and I want everybody to pray for me. <laughs> Do you know something? That lady running off her mouth has done more damage to my church than everybody that's ever smoked in it. I'd have ten smokers over one gal like that. Because she's more done more damage and destroyed my church worse by her talking than all those guys that smoked. Put it together. Give me ten of those guys, man, if one of her. And you say, preacher, why are you talking that way? Because it's the living truth. What she said destroyed more than all those guys doing that every time. They're just destroying their own body. She's destroying half a dozen families or more. She's run off more people than I have. I'm mad at her for it. <laughs> I've run my house. She run a whole slug of them off, man. <laughs> when you run them off, you preach on things. People, people nowadays, brother, they don't want to any preacher preaching against sin he don't want they don't want him naming sin they want him to be nice and smooth and sweet and nice well i i'm a i'm not a nice preacher i just i don't even look like i'm nice do i do i look nice my wife dressed me <laughs> But, brother, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying if you want a new start, you know what you got to do? you got to get, get rid of some things in your life. Yeah. And say, God, give me a new start. And I've had plenty of new starts. Plenty of new starts. And, brother, a new start is something more. Get excited. Now, I'll tell you how to get a new start. Take your Bible and turn to Revelation. Here's another way to get a new start. Climb Mount uh, Ararat and get a new start. Turn to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, and look at verse 4. Revelation chapter 2, and look at verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy, what? Underline it in your Bible. First love. The left it. Left the first love. That can happen to a Christian. He can lose it. Lose that first love. Now watch. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, 
and repent and do what? And do thy first works. You want a new start? I'll tell you what to do. Go right back to that place to where you was when you first got saved and do the first thing you did when you first got saved. Now, I don't know what you did when you first got saved, but you know what I did when I first got saved? I had me a Gideon New Testament. And I jerked that Gideon New Testament out, and I'd say, that's the Bible, that's the Word of God. And I'd open it up, and I'd have one verse memorized, and I had couldn't read the verse in front of it, couldn't read the verse in back of it, but I had one verse memorized. So I'd just read him the one verse, and then I'd say, you read the rest. <laughs> but I'd memorize one verse. I remember I had one verse from that, and, I, and something like that book, that right book right there said, that's God's book, that's the holy word of God, that's God's book. I'm going to read that book, I'm going to read that book, it's going to make all the difference in my life. Yeah. And that book right there, that book right there, changed my whole life. And before I got that book, before I got that book, I couldn't read. I couldn't spell, I couldn't write, I couldn't do anything. And then I come along that book right there. That one. That one. I'll tell you. You've heard my, my testimony before, but I'll tell it to you real quick like. I was 12 years old in the fifth grade. And when I was 12 years old in the fifth grade, my fifth grade teacher said, Nathan can't read, he can't write, he can't spell. I'm going to put him out of class. And my mom and dad said, well, we'll put him in a private school. So at 12 years old, I went to that private school at 12 years old. They put me in the first grade. And at 12 years old, I went to the first grade. And I was pretty tall. Anybody 12 years old here? Anybody 12? You're 12 years old. Stand up, young man. That's how tall I was. Anybody in the first grade? Well, that's how tall they were. <laughs> they were like that. <laughs> and I'd go into the first grade, and I spent a year in the first grade. And I passed it, I think. <laughs> Maybe they just passed me on. <laughs> and I went to the second grade. I was 13 years old. When I went to 13 years old, I went all the way through the second grade. When I was 14 years old, I went through the third grade. When I was 15 years old, I went through the fourth grade. Anybody here 15? When I was 16, my mom and dad ran out of money, and they said, well, we got to put him in the public school. I was 16 years old, I was driving my car, and I was drinking. <laughs> and at 16 years old, they said, you're going to go back to the public school in the fifth grade. So the teacher said, okay, we'll try. So the first day, I took my car and drove it to school. <laughs> and I went inside, and the teacher says, that boy's got a car. I was there, and I, I loved those little guys. Oh, man, I thought they were pretty neat. And I said, I want to see how many of you guys can get my car. I said, 18 of you come and get my car. We, I put 18 kids in my car. The teacher looked out the window, saw 18 kids in my car, and she says, he'll kill them all. We can't have this. So, so, uh, I drove them kids off the playground and drove them around and drove them back. I lasted two weeks in the fifth grade. They said, he is out of here. Now, I was 28 years old before I could ever tell anybody. Because I'd always get a lump in my throat when, when I found out somebody would think how dumb I was. And I'd get a lump right there, it'd swell right up in my throat and it'd choke me to death when I heard the word read. Somebody say school, and I'd get a lump on my throat right there. I hated the word school. I just hated it, literally. 
I hated the teacher. I hated the school building. I hated everything about it. But my daddy said I couldn't quit. <laughs> so I said, okay, I won't quit. Oh, you don't know how many times I want to quit, man. I want to be out of there, man. I want to join the Navy when I was 10. <laughs> my dad wouldn't let me join the Navy till I was 19. <laughs> And I was 16, I was 16, he said, okay, what we're going to do with you? He said, you're going to go to school somewhere. I says, where? He says, I got, there's a class for you. And there's a retarded class up in the high school, but you have to skip the fifth and sixth grade and seventh grade and you can go to that retarded class. And I says, daddy, you know I don't want it. He said, you're going to go. And I said, okay. Oh, man, it killed me to go into that retarded class with them six retarded kids. They were all retarded but me. <laughs> and, you know, down through the years, I make a joke about it. <laughs> you might as well you know, cry about it, but you might as well laugh about it. <laughs> so that's what I do. <laughs> I make a joke. I found a joke one day about it. I thought, boy, that just fits it good. Now, I like that. That just fits this whole thing real good. Man. That just explains it right to a T. Here, here's a joke. Now, it's just a joke. It really didn't happen. <laughs> well, one day I come to school and all the kids put their apple on my desk. They thought I was the teacher. <laughs> here's another one. <laughs> this is just a joke now. It, it didn't really so. Uh, the teacher said, Nathan is the flower of my class, a blooming idiot. <laughs> That's not really so. But what do you do? You just laugh about it. You just say, oh God, thank you for showing me how to read that book right there. For years, for years, that's the only book I could read. And Dr. Ruck, when I went down to his school down there, and he says, uh, uh, you ought to buy uh, the two Babylons by Hissa. Uh, yeah, yeah, I ought to buy two Babylons by Hissa. And I went down to the store and I bought the two Babylons by Hissa. And I opened it up and I said, that's Greek and Hebrew put together. <laughs> and stuck it in the shelf. And then he said, you ought to buy Clarence Larkin's Dispensational Truths. So I went down and bought Clarence Larkin's Dispensational Truths. And I stuck it in, in the bookshelf. And I said, no, 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 that's worse than the other one. Stuck it down in there. And he said, you ought to buy this book. I mean, every book he said you ought to buy, I went out and bought it. Went out and bought it, stuck it right there. And I said, man, I can't read a stick. Not, not one of them. I stuck it right there. Pretty soon I got four, five hundred dollars worth of books that he recommended to buy. But I knew something. Those books were not like that book, because I could read that book, and that book wouldn't bring a blunt lump down to my throat like that. Wouldn't bring a lump inside my throat. Amen. You know what's wrong with a whole bunch of Christians? They never get a new start. I got a new start! Man, what a new start I got! My whole life changed, like from darkness to light. You know what's wrong with a whole bunch of people? They never get a new start. It's the same old thing, same old thing. Aren't you sick and tired of the same old thing? Get your new start. Get your new start and climb Mount Ararat. Mount Ararat. Now, let's pick up another one. Take your Bible and turn to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 3 and look at verse 25. Deuteronomy chapter 3 and look at verse 25. Now look at the verse. Deuteronomy chapter 3 and pick up verse 25. Here's another mountain. You ought to climb this mountain. Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse 25 says, I pray thee, let me go over. And see the good land that is beyond Jordan, the goodly mount, and Lebanon. But the Lord was wrath with me for your sake, and would not hear me. Now underline it. He was wrath with me for your sake. Now that's the only time God was ever mad at Moses. Ain't that something? Only all his lifetime, the only time that God really got mad at Moses was over here on this thing. Was wrath with me for your sake, would not hear me. Boy, that's something. Only time God never heard Moses was right on this case. And the Lord said unto me, Let it suffice thee, speak no more to me of this matter. Ain't that something? 
The Lord says, okay, don't talk to me about it again. I told you, this is the way it's going to be. Now, don't talk about it no more. That's quite a thing for God to say to Moses. Ain't it? Now, verse 27. Get thee up on the top of Pisgah. This is Mount Pisgah. And lift up thy eyes eastward and northward and southward. Uh, not uh, westward, northward and southward and eastward. And behold it with thy eye. For thou shalt not go over this Jordan. So he said, go up on Mount Pisgah. And then what does Mount Pisgah represent? You know what it represents? It represents the argument that God had with Moses. It represents that argument that God had with him. Now, what was the argument that God had with Moses and Moses had with God? Take your Bible and uh, turn over to the book of uh, Numbers and see it. Turn to the book of Numbers and turn to Numbers chapter 20. And see the argument that God had with Moses. Now turn to it. Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20. And look at verse 7. Numbers chapter 20. And look at verse 7. And the Lord spake unto Moses saying. Take thy rod. And gather thou the assembly together. Thou and Aaron and thy brother. And speak unto the rock. Before their eyes. And it shall be given for uh, his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. Now take your pen, and in verse 8, underline where it says, Speak ye unto the rock. Underline it in verse uh, 8. In Numbers chapter 20, verse 8. Speak ye unto the rock. Who's the rock, folks? No, no, okay, here, now let me say, now I'll say it again. Who's the rock? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the rock. Jesus Christ is the rock. So what does he tell him to do? Tells him to speak to the rock. Not hit the rock. Not hit the rock. Why? Because in Exodus chapter 17 verse 5, the rock has already been hit. Exodus 17 5, Moses has already struck the rock with the rod. So what is it a type of? It's a type of Jesus Christ being crucified on the cross of Calvary. He's crucified one time. Jesus died once for our sins. So, brother, you don't go out there and strike that rock twice. You speak to it. Now, Lord, notice what goes what is goes on again. Uh, he said, Mount Pisgah, that's where Moses went. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now ye what? Rebels. He calls them a bunch of rebels. Then what is he? He's a little ticked. Moses is mad. Must we fetch you water out of this rock? Underline that. That's Moses' sin. Moses' sin is what? Right there. Right there. Moses' sin is with his mouth. It's what he said. What did he say? He said, must we fetch you water out of the rock? He's mad and he's ticked and he said, must we do it? Now let me see. Well, wait a minute. Who was going to fetch him water out of the rock? The Lord. the Lord was. But he does what? He said, must we do it? So what does he do? Look at verse 11. And Moses lifted up his hand and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water come out abundantly and the congregation drank and their beast also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron... Because you believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not go uh, bring this congregation to the land which I give unto them. He said, because you do it and do what? Wouldn't give him the glory. Do you know what Mount Pisgah represents? It represents giving God the glory for everything that you do. Give him the glory. Do you give God the glory for everything that takes place? You ought to give him the glory. Now you say, how's that? Just like this. You ask for testimonies. You know what I do when I ask for testimonies in my church? I say, no, let's have some testimonies. You know what folks do? They don't want to give, up, give any testimony. I say, come stand up and give a testimony. 
Nobody wants to stand up and give a testimony. Now, brother, if God's done something for your soul, saved your soul, you ought to stand up and give a testimony of it. Now, amen. I had a guy in my church. He'd come, and he'd come, and he'd come, and he'd come. And he'd come every Sunday. Now, he must have come every Sunday for, for 15, 20 years. And then one Sunday I'm preaching on, and I sat down in front. He comes up front, and I said, Brother, what you coming for? And he says, I've never stood before a congregation and told them I'm saved and accept Jesus as my faith. I said, uh, you've never done that? He said, I've never done it. I said, well, okay, here's an opportunity. Stand right here. Tell everybody that you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. And he stands up, and he's trembling and shaking, and he says, I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I want to tell everybody that I've done it right in front of this church. Well, this guy's been coming to my church for 20 years. Ain't that something? Ain't that something? Amen. You know what some folks say? Ah, oh, man, stand up and give a testimony. I'll oh, do that first thing you do, first thing you get saved. Stand up and give a testimony. Jesus Christ be saved one week and stand up and give a testimony. I got saved. I stood up and gave a testimony right after I got saved. I walked down the aisle, Dr. Workman Church, got down on my knees. And then I stood up and not poked it and told everybody that that drawing that he drew was the right thing for you. I got down on my knees and stood up and said, That's the right thing. I said, Dr. Wilson, I'm going to give a testimony before I get baptized. He said, Go ahead. <laughs> I stood up and that picture he drew of the cross and I just got him saved right down there. I, I thought I'd got saved before, but that's when I got saved. Come on, you with me? I thought you got to say that. You now, now, you know what you got to do? You got to stand up and give a testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. Give him the glory. Give him the glory. Now, here's another mount. Take your mount, uh, take your Bible, and turn to, to the New Testament, and uh, turn to uh, the uh, Gospel of, uh, of uh, Luke. And that's... Calvary. That's Mount Calvary. That's all through there. Amen? How many know what Mount Calvary stands for? Well, you folks know what Mount Calvary stands for. Mount Calvary is that place that Jesus Christ was crucified. Years is spent in vanity and pride Caring not my Lord was crucified Knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. You know something? Have you ever been to the mountain Calvary? That's one mountain you can't climb. You can't climb Mount Calvary. Everybody's trying to climb Mount Calvary. They'll say, I go, I knock on the door and say, uh, where are you going when you die? And they say, I'm a fiscal pig. I said, where are you going when you die? He said, I'm an Episcopalian. He's trying to climb Mount Calvary. You can't climb Mount Calvary. You've got to get out on your hands and knees to get up to Mount Calvary. You find Mount Calvary on your knees when you bow your head as a sinner and say, oh God, save my sinful soul. You can't climb Mount Calvary. Everybody's trying to climb it. I knock on the door. I say, where are you going when you die? For sure. I am a Catholic. I was born a Catholic. I was raised a Catholic. And I will die a Catholic. You know what I want to say, but I don't say it. I say, yeah, you're going to hell a Catholic. <laughs> but I don't say that. I don't say that. You know what they're doing? They're trusting in being a Catholic to save them. I've had them say, I'm an Episcopalian. You're trusting in being an Episcopalian to save them. You know what you're trusting? You're trusting in your church to save it. You know what you do? You go to hell. You know what you got to trust in? You've got to get, you want to climb the Mount Calvary? How many of you have been to Calvary? Yeah. Isn't it a wonderful place? Yeah. Where you come to that place with your burden of sin and you say, Lord, I don't want to go to hell. Please yeah. save my soul. Please wash me in your precious blood and cleanse me and make me whole. Yeah. I want you as my Savior. Now you ought to come to the Mount 
Calvary. Don't confuse that with religion. That's what's wrong with America today. Everybody's confusing salvation with religion. Salvation is a free gift. A gift to be received and not a goal to be achieved. If you've never been born again, you've never been saved, you ought to come to Mount Calvary. Come to Jesus. Get on your knees and ask God to save your soul. I had an unsaved man in my church last Sunday night. And everybody said, Preacher, you know what you did? You changed that message to salvation. That wasn't a salvation message. You just changed it to salvation. And she said, and they said, we knew what you was doing. You was just trying to get them saved. You know, when I see a sinner, and I look out there and see some poor sinner on the road to hell, and some guy brought him to church and said, Preacher, this guy's lost. Will you preach at him? Will you preach at him if he's lost? I want to see him get saved. You want know to do it? I try to change my message to point to that lost soul going to hell. And if you're here tonight and you're not saved, I want you to point you to the cross of Calvary and climb and on, it on your hands and knees and say, I want to be saved in the blood of Jesus Christ. Trust Him as your Savior tonight. He'll save you if you ask Him. Will you ask Him? Will you ask Him? Are you a sinner? You're taking the first step. Are you a lost sinner? You've taken the second step. Are your sins taking you to hell? You've taken the third step. Did Jesus die for your sins? You've taken the fourth step. Now, will you accept him? Will you accept him? With every eye closed and every head bowed. Maybe there's some sinner here tonight that's on the road to hell and he comes to the Mount Calvary. The only way to climb that mountain is get on your hands and knees and ask Jesus Christ to save you. Get on your hands and knees and ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior. Oh, it's a wonderful thing to get a new start in life by coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe with every eye closed, maybe every head bowed, maybe there's somebody here tonight say, Preacher, I'm not saved, and I know I'm not saved, but I'd like to be, and I want you to pray for me. Would you raise your hand? Is a one in the building tonight? So, preacher, I'm not saved, but I'd like to be. I'd like to be. Will you pray for me? Will you raise your hand? Is there one at all? Any at all? Now, you Christians here tonight, I want to ask you: How much are you giving up? How much is it costing you to serve the Lord? What does it cost you to serve Him? Have you been to Mount Moriah and say, Lord, I want it to cost me something. I want it to cost me something to serve you. Now, I pray that God would give you the grace to pay the cost. To pay that cost and serve him. Serve him. Yes, old preacher, uh, it would be quite a cost. Yeah, but the Lord will reward you for it. Very eye closed. Maybe there's a Christian here who's a preacher. I'm praying about that matter, and I want you to pray with me about it. Would you raise your hand? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. All right. Uh, dear Lord Jesus, I pray you would bless this invitation. I pray that you would encourage them and strengthen them. And Lord, I pray you would help them to make the decisions tonight to climb the mountains and, and get the blessing from climbing the mountain. And Lord, most of all, I pray if there's somebody here tonight that didn't raise their hand and they're lost and they need to be saved, Lord, I pray you'd speak to their heart, speak to their mind, and Lord, help them to trust your precious blood. In Jesus' precious name I pray, and for his sake, amen. Brother Martin.